seems like it's a Kenzie trait to go on and on. <clears throat> but it is good to be in the Lord's house. We're glad you're here. As the pastor already has mentioned, this is the best place to be in the Lord's house. There's so many other places we could be. But thank the Lord, this is the place that we're at, and it's the best place we could be. Uh, in the days and hours in which we live, uh, we need a haven, a place to come in and, and get out of the world. The world is crazy. That's not a news flash for you. The world is, is nuts. And it seems like they're taking more crazy medicine by the day. And everywhere you, every time you look around at something else that makes you as a Christian scratch your head and just baffle that. But thank God we're children of the light. Not of the darkness, not of the night. We're not children of the night. We're children of the day, the scripture says. And I'm glad uh, that we walk in the light. Amen. And we uh, we don't have to be, uh, we don't have to wonder and worry about what tomorrow holds and what the next day will bring. We may be concerned, but we don't need to fret about it. We know who holds tomorrow. Amen. And uh, he's in complete control tonight. And the Lord's not getting uh, his Twitter, Twitter account updated. He's not seeing the latest post to be, to, to be informed about what's going on. He knows what's happening. We get, that gives us peace. That's the only thing that gives me peace tonight, is I know the Lord's in control. He knows what's going on. Well, let's go to the book of Job, and we are in chapter, we're going to begin in chapter 38. And I'm going to tell you tonight that this is a two-part message. I had thought about trying to preach it all <coughs> in one setting, but I'm not going to do that tonight. But we'll conclude it tomorrow night, and your attendance will tell me <laughs> how much you enjoy tonight. <laughs> Oh, I'm not that naive, amen. Uh, but uh, we will conclude tomorrow night by the help of the Lord, unless things change. But I believe this is the route to go. I'll give you a little bit tonight, a little bit tomorrow. And uh, on this thought out of Job. Now what we're going to do, we're going to uh, get our text from one portion of the book. And then we're going to jump to the front. So I want to get our text from verse number 22 and verse number 38, uh, out of chapter 38, verse 22 and verse number 23. This is the Lord speaking. Now, if you know anything about the book of Job, you know that Job, uh, he faces situations that that's what we're going to look at in a moment. Then his friends come and Predominantly, the book is is uh, written of uh, the commentary from he, him and his three friends. And then uh, Elihu speaks up towards the end, uh, the latter part of the book. And it's here in chapter number 38 that the Lord begins to speak. And the Lord speaks uh, pretty much through the rest of the book. And he begins in chapter 38. Uh, the Bible says the Lord answered Job out of the world. And he begins to list uh, several questions. And I want to look at these two verses in verse 22 and verse 23 out of the book of Job, chapter 38. Hast thou, the Lord speaking again to Job, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. The treasures of the hail, which I have reserved, the Bible says, against the time of trouble. You know, the truth of the matter is tonight that no one likes trouble. Not, uh, not any normal person. No one asks for trouble. Right. Uh, but you know, we all have troubles. True. Sad part about life is someone can work hard and use all of their help in order to save the money. 
And then when the days where they want to draw from the interest of that investments, troubles come and they have to spend all of their money to maintain their health. Others save their money and sacrifice to provide good education for their children when they grow up. Only to see their children come of age and troubles come and these resources are spent. Some have troubles. They work all their lives anticipating the time when they're able to enjoy their retirement days. But trouble strikes their health and they struggle just to make it from the bedroom to the kitchen. Or hold a cup of coffee steadily in their hand. Families look forward to their kids growing up and watching their kids grow and then their kids grow out, uh, go out and, and have children and then they all come together and enjoy their family. But troubles come and that breaks up the family, sometimes from hard feelings or bitterness, sometimes uh, uh, health issues or, sad to say, sometimes even death. Troubles. Job was a man that faced troubles, didn't he? Again, you turn back to Job, chapter number 1. I would have to say, outside of the Lord, there probably isn't anyone listed in the book that faced more troubles than Job. Now, God didn't write everything about everybody in his book. But what he did write to us about Job, it revealed to us about his troubles. I want you to notice something about Job. He faced troubles, but notice about his life. In verse number 1, we find this about Job's character. We find in chapter 1, verse number 1, that Job was right in his relationships. The Bible said that Job was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. His relationship was right, notice number 1, with God. The book says he was perfect. Now we know from the commentary of the Bible that that word perfect obviously does not mean sinless. We will not go through the scriptures tonight to prove the fact that, that no one is sinless. But it's all throughout. There's none uh, righteous, no, not one. And Solomon said there's no man that sinneth not. Uh, so we, we know that this word perfect doesn't mean sinless. But it just means that his his character was, was uh, one that he, he, he was cautious of. It means that he walked with a heart of sincerity that, that he wanted to do right. And he was right in his relationship with God. And not only was right in relationship with God, but he's right in his relationship with man. The Bible said that he was upright. That word upright means he was honest in his dealings. You didn't mind getting into a, a contract with Job. Because you knew he would not renege. You didn't mind Job buying something from you on a handshake. You didn't have to have him fill out 533 documents with three different lawyers to read them. <laughs> you knew that Job was an honest man. Amen. He was upright. So number one, he, was, he faced troubles even though he was right in his relationships. Uh, not only was he right in his relationships, but can I say he was scriptural in his steps. Verse number 2 and 3 of chapter 1. The book tells us several things about his steps. It says he had these sons and daughters and he had these things, but he was the greatest man of the East. He was, uh, he was scriptural with his steps. I'm sorry, verse number 1. He eschewed evil. That word eschewed, we don't use that word in our day, but that word means to refrain, to keep away, to avoid, to abstain. So when Job saw evil, he didn't linger around it. Right. When Job was hearing someone gossip or someone say something they shouldn't say, he didn't tune an ear in. Yeah. He eschewed evil. He got as far away from it as he could. He was scriptural in his steps. He was right in his relationship. But then he was righteous with his riches. In verse 2 and 3, the Bible said that he was the greatest man in the East. But he kept these riches in the right perspective. And then he was fervent in his faith in verses 4 and 5. The Bible talks about how his sons and daughters would get together, but Job would fast for them. And the Bible says, what's the last word in verse number 5? Job did continually. 
He was sperming in his faith. Even though Job had all of these good qualities, Job was a man that if we say who, I don't know how you do it around here, but Job wants to join Southside Baptist Church. Is there anybody who has any objection? There's not a soul that can honestly raise their hands. Right. That's right. So Job was a good man, but I want you to notice that he faced trouble. Verse number 25 of chapter 3. Job said, For the thing which I greatly feared is coming to me. Mm -hmm. That which I was afraid of most is coming to me. You know what that tells me? Job did not think he was immune to troubles. Job knew that troubles would come. And you see the troubles of Job. Verses 13 through verse 17 of chapter 1. He was crippled by bankruptcy. He lost all of these things. In a matter of just time, Job, in a matter of a short time, Job lost everything. All of his wealth was gone. Trouble. He was crippled by bankruptcy. And then secondly, Job in verse 18 through verse and 19 of chapter 1, all of his children, they were in their uh, 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 siblings' home and they were enjoying their fellowship and, and they were having a good time. I would imagine it was a worldly good time, but uh, they were having a good family together. And all of a sudden, uh, what we would call a tornado came, if you will, and it blew the house down. And not one of his children escaped. And their Job was not only crippled by bankruptcy, but then he was crushed by bereavement. Every one of his children died in just a matter of seconds. Mm. Troubles. And then verse 7 of chapter 2, Job was covered by boils. To add insult to injury. To lose all of your money. To lose something that you cannot get back. Children. And then to be covered by boils. Job had troubles. But going back to our text verse. The book says this in, in that chapter. I'll read it to you again. Job, the Lord says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of snow? Hast thou seen the treasures of hell, which I have reserved against the time of trouble? What the Lord is asking Job, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I counted somewhere up to 19 questions, give or take a few, before he gets to this verse. The Lord says to Job, Job, where were you at when this happened? Where were you at when that happened? He says, Job, how about this matter of the elements? Snow and hail. That I bring out, it's a treasure in troubles. He talks about how no one can go to this place. No one knows about these treasures. But I preserve them in a place where no one can freely go, and they're there, that I bring them out when troubles come. There's a place that Job didn't realize, he couldn't see, that contained some of God's greatest treasures. And he's speaking about the elements, and, and if you read through scriptures, there are times that the Lord used the elements to give victory to the children of Israel. He called them treasures in troubles. And with that, I want to springboard that thought tonight to give you treasures we find only in troubles. Tonight, I believe we'll probably just cover one thing, but we'll have many things to say about that. I want you to notice, first of all, that troubles show us our frailty. Right. Troubles show us our frailty. That word frailty means delicate, weak. Easily broken or destroyed, fragile, easily tempted, morally weak. Troubles have a way of showing us just how weak we are, just how frail we are, just how easily broken we are. You know what troubles will do when talking about this matter of frailty? Number one, troubles cause us to look upward. In chapter number 1 and verse number 20, Job is experiencing these different troubles that we mentioned. And he says this in verse number 20 of chapter 1, if I can get to it. Job, of course, 
all this came on him all of a sudden in a very familiar passage Job says he rent his clothes or his mantle he shaved his head he fell down upon the ground and worshipped I mean, Job, but that, if you know anything about the culture of the East, you know when they rent their clothes, when they, and they even do that in our world today, you'll see them uh, throwing dust up in the air, and, and, and really, we're looking at them like they're going crazy, but it's a sign of, of mourning, it's a sign of just emptiness. Hear this great man, he is, he is not boastful, he is not proud, he, he's not thinking about how great he was, he was the greatest man of the East, but he is rending his clothes and he has shaved his head. He is looking inward and he's seen just how frail that he is. You see, the truth of the matter is we can all boast and be proud when we don't have trouble. We can all be confident what we will do when we are faced with trouble. Hmm. I tell you what, if I, I understand it, but if that was me, yeah, I tell you what he should do. <laughs> uh, let, let me just tell you where you're messing up here. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the best thing to do. <laughs> we all can stand back with our, you know, our shoulders cocked up and our head all boastfully uh, on our shoulders saying what we would do and how we would act. But when troubles come, yes, sir. we realize, hey, we're, we're not great at all. We can't be begin to understand what it's like if we didn't have troubles. Let me ask you, how cocky and proud and arrogant would we be tonight if we never faced trouble? How boastful will we walk into this church if we never had one obstacle in our way? If everything was always smooth sailing for us, if we never faced any trouble, while we would come in here and we would say, Preacher, I know you've got a schedule, Preacher, but I tell you, I really believe that you need to hear from me. Now, I know you got special singers, but I tell you, I just got a melody that could just soothe the crowd if you let me sing. We would be the most arrogant, obnoxious people if it wasn't for troubles. Mm. Troubles cause us to look inward and realize, hey, we're not really that great after all. Right. It's true. <laughs> we're not really super Christian after all. We're not really immune to hardships and broken hearts and tragic lives. We, we look inward to realize we are just not that strong. Tell you tonight, we wouldn't know that if we didn't have troubles. Hmm. You mark it down tonight, we would not have a millimeter of humility if we didn't face troubles. Right. Troubles have a way of causing us to look inside to see our weakness. The fact that we can't do as much as we thought we could nor could we be confident in what we would do or wouldn't do. I remember before I was married and had children, Brother Tony's here tonight and probably can attest to some of this, I could tell my brothers how they ought to raise their children. I was a great, great parent before I was married and had children. <laughs> And I, I don't know, but I'm going to step out on the limb and I say I might not be the only person like that here. Yeah. But you know, it just seems like when, when you're faced and you have the children, all of a sudden, you, all these things that everybody should have implemented, you know that you should have implemented them, but implementing them was half the battle. <laughs> then being consistent. Yeah. You got it. That's so true with troubles. I'm telling you tonight, troubles aren't so bad after all. Problems aren't so bad after all. Without them, why, we would think we were super Christian. Without them, we would think that God must love us more than he does anybody else. Look at that one over there. Their homes broke 
broken up. Look at that one over there. They lost their job. Look at that one over there. They got some kind of sickness. Look at that one over there. Uh, they're having this problem and that problem. I tell you what, God must look at me and think I'm the best. Mm. Oh, it's a great treasure tonight that God gives us trouble because it keeps us on the low shelf. Troubles cause us to look inward. And then troubles, notice what he said in verse number 21. Naked came I out of my mother's room, and naked shall I return thither. Troubles cause us to look outward. Now the book said that Job was what? He was the greatest man in the East. I, I believe, I'm not going to say that, but I'll look and make sure. I believe the book says he was the greatest man in a, uh, the greatest man in all. He had the greatest of all the men of the East. He wasn't just the great man in the East. He was the greatest of all the men in the East. Yeah. I mean, he, he managed his possessions, his possessions in a way that were pleasing to the Lord. He put his possessions in the proper perspective. He did what David said in Psalm 62 in verse number 10. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Job wasn't a, uh, a, a, a god. Money wasn't Job's god. Job wasn't concerned because he was so great that he set his heart upon it. He wasn't an a, a, a envious, uh, covetous, greedy Christian. Job used his, his riches as unto the Lord. Now troubles come in Job's life. And his wealth is gone. Sadly, his children are dead and buried. And he says, I had nothing when I came into this world, and I have nothing now. I had nothing when God brought me into this world, and now I'm back just like I started, without a thing. And Job says, basically, I haven't lost anything. <laughs> Job was able to see the big picture. You see, troubles cause us to look outward. To see, you know, we really don't have it so bad. It sure does help you and me when we begin to look outward. Sometimes we live in front of a mirror too much. We always want to look at ourselves. Hmm. And we want to magnify our troubles. But I encourage you tonight to go to the children's hospital when you think you have troubles. I remember when we were in Atlanta in the PICU with Emma. She just got out of the NICU. And uh, of course, uh, she had been born and she went into the NICU there in Chattanooga for, I'd say, uh, about seven, eight weeks. We brought her home and it's a long story, but she shouldn't have been allowed to come home. And we, God worked out providentially some situations where we met a doctor in Atlanta that was able to do a surgery uh, that would help her with her, her breathing that she was needing with, her jaw and so on and so forth. Of course, we're sitting there in Atlanta. All of this kind of happened in a world. Matter of, fact, matter of fact, when we went to meet the doctor, to consult the doctor for the first time just to investigate the procedure that he was, he was able to perform, he wanted to admit her right then. I told my wife, I said, he must be wanting to pay off a yacht or going on a vacation. This doesn't, this doesn't sound right. I told him, we have to pray about that. We have to think about it. He said, this, this girl needs to go right now. She needs to be put in the hospital right now. Long and short of it, it went but a day or two, and we, we, we prayed about it, and that really did feel like that's what the Lord wanted us to do, and we're glad we did. But nonetheless, we're sitting in that hospital room. It all happened in a whirlwind. And the procedure they did, they cut her jaw, and I may have told you about this, and they, they, her jaw was recessed. She couldn't breathe properly, and they had these two screws that were exposed. And uh, here she's laying in this bed, she, of course, she's swollen. If you've ever seen people that do cranial facial kind of work, their face is real swollen, their head is real swollen. And she has these two pieces of 
metal dangling out from her head going into her skin. And the doctors come by and turn them twice a day. Mm -hmm. And they had her completely paralyzed. And they had her completely sedated. And they were scared because of her, her airway was so small. They were so scared that it, her tongue could possibly uh, move and cut off her airway. So they had her tongue sutured to her lip. Mm. You see thread going through her tongue into her lip. And there she lays. She, if she wasn't breathing, you'd think she's dead by looking at her. Mm. And we're sitting in this hospital room. It's Mother's Day. Mm. And then, you know, you begin to think about your troubles. Then everything gets chaotic. People come rushing through and they're taking another kid into their room. You begin hearing what's happened. And you hear that this little kid, two or three years old, lived in an apartment complex. The gate wasn't locked at the pool. Mm. Worse than that, the pool was empty. And the little kid goes not to the shallow end, but to the deep end and falls into an empty pool. Mm. And you know all the HIPAA laws, you don't hear it from the doctors, but you hear people talking and they're thinking there's no way this child's going to survive. They already got the investigating looking into the owner of the apartment business because it wasn't properly secured. You know what troubles cause you to do? To look out for it. That's what they should cause us to do. Instead of focusing on how bad we have it, we should focus on others. That's what Job did. Job said, naked I was when I came in and naked I I said, it's not so bad. I haven't lost anything. That's a treasure tonight from troubles because when troubles come, it helps us not only look inward, but also should help us to look outward. And then Job says in verse number 21, he concludes that verse. He said, the Lord, naked came out from my mother's room, naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. What does he say? Blessed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a, what a beautiful quote. I mean, I'd say that quote is just as precious as Psalms 23. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not only does troubles cause us to look inward and troubles cause us to look outward. But I submit to you probably one of the greatest troubles when it comes to our frailty is it causes us to look upward. Yes. I almost say that if that is one of the main motivations of troubles. It causes us to turn our heart above what our body and mind is capable of handling. I mean, if we could handle our troubles, if, if we could man through our troubles, if we could tolerate our troubles, we would be self-sufficient. But God sometimes lays on us burdens that we cannot bear. The little statement says God won't put on you anything you, uh, greater than you can bear. That's not the truth. That's not a biblical statement. That's not an accurate statement. It sounds good. And we may say it because we, we think it's true. And we may say it not really be belittling the truth of it. But the truth of the matter is God puts on us more than we can bear. So we can bring it to him and he can bear it for us. Amen. 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 That's good. That's good preaching. See, tonight troubles cause us to go to someone stronger than we are. Troubles cause us to retreat to someone bigger than we are. Yeah. It's no less true than a child when one of these children, their toy is broken. I mean something small. But to them it's what? <laughs> it's life offering. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's big. It's the end of, I mean they cannot exist if things continue. If these wheels don't go back on this little truck 
I don't know if I can face another day. <laughs> That's right. And they're weeping, their heart is broken, and their life is crushed, and they bring it to their dead as if, I'm hoping you can. And their parent looks at it, and it's not a big problem to them at all. Just one little thing. Well, I may have done that a thousand times before that child was ever even born. That's just like the Lord in our thoughts. We come down to the altar and, and we weep and we cry, but God puts on us those burdens so we'll come down to the altar, so we'll weep and we'll cry. That's a treasure in trouble. It causes us to look upward. It causes us to look upward. Sure, some could say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why, we can say that when everything's working out well. Why, we can say, Amen, Brother Joe. Preach it, Brother Joe. That's exactly right. I believe every word of it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We can run around the church and shout like the brother and I were talking about, like they do down south, and go around and shout the service out. But then we go to a funeral of our ten children. And we look on our TD Ameritrade and every, every stock we ever had, everybody went bankrupt. You look at your, you look at your uh, lands and, and the, the bank is there to foreclose. You, you lost your job and it's a great recession. Job wasn't saying that when everything was going well. Job was saying that when everything was going upside down. Trouble came and the Lord brought out of the reserves this treasure. He showed Job this one truth. That things aren't dependable, but the Lord was. Yeah. Things change. Circumstances get worse. Family members can die and be gone. Riches can be depleted. All of those things can happen, but the Lord never changes. Amen. Just like Jonah when he sat under that tree and he got angry and he said, God, I want that tree and, and you took it away. Hey, I'm telling you, even though the gourd was gone, God wasn't. And even though troubles came, Job was able to see because of all of the troubles he faced at the time he wasn't, uh, things weren't going right his way. Uh, things may have not been looking like uh, it wasn't going to be getting any better. Uh, he had no riches to rely on. He had no children to uh, get comfort in. He had no wife that was understanding to him. Everything was going to Job. Where did he retreat? There was no more better to retreat than the Lord. Hey. Troubles. Troubles give us the great treasure and this truth that we are so frail, but the Lord is so sufficient. Right. Treasures in our trouble, it shows us our frailty. A while back, you, you probably heard of uh, Ron Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the kids would know him as Pastor Pirate. Ron Hamilton is, I don't want to step out and say it, but I would say he would be very close to uh, our uh, equivalents of someone like uh, <clears throat> the lady that wrote Blessed Assurance. Um, help me now, blind. Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby. Ron Hamilton wrote so many hymns. I know you can't compare them to, but you understand what I'm saying. He's a modern day hymn writer. He, you know, the Lord blessed him with that ability. He wrote a lot of great hymns. And I'm not going to say all that happened with Ron Hamilton. If you know anything about uh, his family, they suffered some pretty tragic events. Lost a child in a tragic way. And then time went on and Brother Hamilton began to show signs of, of dementia and Alzheimer's, if you will. And his wife, uh, she kept him out of public view for quite some time. 
But then, within the last year or so, she began on social media to capture him in some good pop posture. Nothing that was derogatory, nothing that was belittling. She does that a lot now, but when she first started, I remember watching it. And one of the first posts I remember seeing from her was Brother Hamilton. Of course, you have to understand, he's got full dementia. He has that appearance that individuals have when they have that, that sickness, that disease, that infirmity. Obviously, his hair is not combed and properly looked as good as he did, but they have him looking very presentable. And he's sitting at a piano. And she captured a song that he had written. If you know anything about his music, you'll know the words of the song. But the song says, God never moves without purpose or plan. And he's singing this, a man with dementia. When trying to serve and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seem long and darkness. He gave up a song. And he began to play and sing the chorus. All oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. That's right. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. And I sat there in my office watching this servant of God that didn't even know where he was at, I would imagine. And I don't say that in no mean way at all. And I'm telling you, I have heard that song sung a lot of times. But it didn't mean nothing to me as much as it did then. Because here was a man singing it <clears throat> that had faced troubles. And it was blessing me. Realizing that, hey, this is a treasure that I would have never enjoyed had troubles not come. The little saying says, you don't appreciate the well or the water till the well runs dry. Some of the darkest days in, uh, in my life, they haven't been very dark, but this scripture the Lord gave me in Joshua 1 verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. <clears throat> troubles, there's treasure in those troubles. It reveals our frailty. You know, today with the sun out in dreary Erie, I remember thinking when I was told about Erie that Florida has so many days of sunshine and Erie has to rest. <laughs> but today we experienced one of those 57 days. Yeah. But you know when the sun was shining today, you didn't, you couldn't see it, but so were the stars. Beyond the sun, there were stars, but we couldn't see the stars till they got dark. I want to tell you something. There's some great beauty that we can't see That's right. until God brings darkness. It's a treasure in troubles. Hmm. I'm not telling you to be a storm chaser. I've met those people. How you doing, brother? And they're always in a valley. <laughs> You can just bypass them. You don't even want to ask them. You pray they don't see you. I'm not making light of things that are problems, but I'm telling you tonight, there are some that face troubles. And I tell you tonight, a great treasure is that the Lord is still on the throne. Treasure is in trouble. Will you bow your head with me tonight? They're going to come and play verse and invitation, whatever you desire to play, but Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. Can I tell you, 